While the subject of Kabbalah is perhaps one of the most marketable ideas, the foundational teachings of Kabbalah are missing from most people's mental libraries. The reality is that Kabbalah is not a subject you teach to the masses, but there are times that our sages choose to teach major things to regular people. Tonight, the Ramban is going to take us on a journey into the foundations of Kabbalah and even an elevated journey into the world of Kabbalah when it has to do with intimacy. Once a person hears the first few words and even the first few sections, they may feel like they're lost. They may feel like they're disconnected. But just like every other lecture in this series, by the time we complete it, every single person, whether they are an expert, Talmit Chacham, or even a newbie, will take something home that could literally transform their lives. Enjoy, share, and be holy. We're back here on our Tuesday night Jewish Intimacy series based on the Ramban's Igeret HaKodesh written nearly 750 years ago and uh, the Sefer that we're using was also uh, translated uh, both the uh, Hebrew and English uh, by his great-great-grandson um, that uh, 26 generation uh, grandson where he's actually coming out with new copies of it with uh, some other new things in the very near future Rabbi Yaakov Bar Nachman Tonight's show will be for the Refua Shlema and Atzlacha Rabba for Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit Rabbi Sara Bat Anat Rabbi Levana Bat Sara Avi Mori David Ben Esriya Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora um, Sarah Bat uh, Esther and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noah Hides and uh, also, one second, we have a, uh, almost, one second, we have a sponsor that uh, actually rather, I was going to mention tomorrow, but I'll mention tonight, uh, simply because the, uh, I think tonight's show is going to be very powerful and is going to help them quite a bit. Uh, and the Tshiyot uh, Hoa is going to be for the Atzlacha uh, of the Jacobo family in Panama and uh, also for their uh, new baby Esther Leah, and also for the Ilui Nishmat of Shlomo ben Silia, Moshe ben Esther, and Gabriel ben Shelly. Kadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Otam, B'Kom Yikol Kol, Chayim Arukim, Shlemim, Meleim Torah, Mitzvot, Gminut Chasadim, Nachat Ubracha, Shlom Bayit Amiti, Be'ezot Hashem, and uh, all of the brachot of Yeshuot. And uh, anybody else that uh, wants to... Uh, uh, sponsor the shiurim. Uh, it's not just for the sake of uh, me saying your name, which uh, certainly is a good thing, but uh, uh, to have a shiur Torah uh, sponsorship, it means that forevermore the uh, merits of this shiur go to you. Uh, so whether you want a blessing for Parnasa or you want a blessing for uh, Zivugagun, or you want a blessing for anything uh, in particular, these shiurim get to literally thousands upon thousands of people and transform their lives. If a single person uh, does tshuva from them, takes on a mitzvah from them, literally every single one of those things goes to your account uh, as uh, one of the supporters of the shiurim. So I highly recommend people uh, jump on board, like some of the people that are more uh, uh, regulars, uh, simply because it's a, uh, it's a cheap deal uh, for, for a person to get uh, merits that simply uh, work while he or she is sleeping forever. Uh, even after their life, because these Shulim Baruch Hashem are uh, not only on our YouTube channel, they're also on uh, our app, they're on our website, uh, they go on uh, eventually on USBs, and Baruch Hashem, these Shulim uh, are uh, always going to be for the merit of those people that are behind them, that sponsored them, and Baruch Hashem uh, for all of those that have. So tonight's Shul is uh, going to be a, uh, a little bit different than some of the most recent shiurim that we've done uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's going to be a lot of reading. Uh, a lot of reading, I know that some of you guys uh, don't mind because you're obviously hearing Divrei Elohim Chaim, you're hearing the words of the living God where the words of the sages are uh, the, uh, in essence the same concept as uh, hearing it at Mount Sinai. So whether it's me repeating what they said in my own words or me reading it, uh, sometimes the latter is even better. Uh, but aside from that, uh, aside from there being a, a bulk of the shiur being reading, uh, which of course I'll explain along the way, 
The, uh, the shiur is going to involve a subject that I don't delve into often publicly uh, for many reasons. Uh, uh, one of them uh, mainly because it's not fit, it's not suitable for the public. We've done it once before uh, in this shiur and uh, delving into the subject of Kabbalah. Now, uh, we, uh, earlier in the series, we uh, delved into Kabbalah, some basics of Kabbalah, some other things. Tonight, we're going to certainly delve into more things uh, that are actually higher level. Uh, so for those of you that are uh, new to it, uh, unlike the last shiul that I actually recommended for people not to watch it, uh, in this particular case, uh, watch it even if you don't understand anything of what I'm saying. Uh, by the end, you're going to understand that the point is actually relevant to every single one of us. Uh, but that's going to be by the end. So you'll have to suffer along with us uh, and, uh, uh, and obviously absorb some uh, holiness, uh, which uh, is the best suffering possible. But the point is, is that the Kabbalah, the Kabbalistic world is not a, uh, is not a subject that uh, should be taught without, uh, you know, precise directions uh, where uh, someone is learning from a, uh, you know, a person that's a mekubal, someone that is a uh, uh, well-learned Talmit uh, Chacham and not just uh, learning on their own. Uh, and this is why I always tell people that if somebody says that he's teaching the public uh, Kabbalah on a regular basis, that's already one too many red flags because it's uh, in the world of Kabbalah, anyone that knows Kabbalah, knows that it's not a subject that you teach the masses on a regular basis. From time to time, there are different concepts of Kabbalah that you can teach, uh, but to teach it on a regular basis means that he's pulling a wool over people's eyes in order to entice them to watch something different. Uh, so in this particular case, we're going to be reading the, uh, the words of the Ramban, Nachmanides, that lived about 750 years ago. And uh, these, uh, these words, again... To some of you, they're not going to make any sense whatsoever in the beginning. To others, it's going to make partial sense. To others, perhaps even a little bit more. But certainly, each one of us is going to be scratching our head along the way, trying to figure out where am I and where are these sages? Meaning that there is the, the, uh, uh, you know, the dif distance between us and these holy people, these holy sages, is literally wider uh, than, than you can humanly imagine. It's literally wider than the distance between us and monkeys and chimpanzees. And that's why the more you learn Torah, the more you realize how comical it is when people either distort the Torah, try to uh, reinterpret the Torah, try to uh, go against the Torah, try to reject the Torah. It's literally comical that people actually think that they, are, uh, they know more than the Torah or any of the sages. So, with that being said, we're going to get into it. It's probably going to be a long one, and the Bezat Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, will give us the strength and the ability and the wherewithal to uh, give you the words exactly as He wants us to give them to you. So, the Ramban has, uh, has taught us already quite a few times how important are the thoughts uh, during, the, uh, you know, during the act, uh, the unity between a husband and his wife, uh, in fact, the, uh, the mindset of a person is, uh, is something that needs to be prepared well before the actual intimate act. Uh, if a person uh, fills his mind with filth, fills his mind with pornography, fills his mind with all types of garbage uh, from uh, television and YouTube channels and all types of other social networks, then certainly they're not going to be prepared for the time where they need to reach the highest level of holiness, which is during the act of intimacy. You know, we, that alone, we already understood from the Ramban that there is literally a world of difference between intimacy in the Jewish world, in the, in the, in the holy part of the Jewish world, and sexuality in the rest of the world. Uh, you know, on one end, you have a, another way to connect to your Creator, another way to sanctify yourself and unite with the Creator, whereas the latter, it's literally uniting with the animals and becoming one with them. Uh, and that's in essence how many of us uh, thought about intimacy until uh, we learned from the Ramban. So the Ramban has told us that one of the biggest aspects of it is, a, uh, is the thoughts 
Of course, he also mentioned throughout the series the importance of diet, the importance of hygiene, the importance of uh, spiritual preparation. But tonight, he's going to go into deeper into thoughts, which is uh, why is it that the thoughts are so critical and in so many words, trying to explain to us the Kabbalistic thoughts, the Kabbalistic teachings of how a thought can form something, you know, where, you know, when we usually think about, you know, any idea that a person has, you know, the average person thinks, okay, the idea that I have, uh, if it did not lead to action, then it's just, you know, simply it's gone. It's as if it never existed, or even if it does exist, it's in the, you know, back of the memory bank. It's in the long-term memory section of the brain. Uh, and that's generally the way psychologists teach it. That's generally the way that uh, most people look at thoughts. Uh, simply put, they think that if there's no action, uh, then the thought is gone. It didn't do anything. But the Ramban has taught us otherwise. In fact, the Ramban has taught us that these thoughts do do something, even if you don't see it, and sometimes even if you don't want to see it or don't want it to do anything, it still does. And in fact, tonight, he's going to show us how these thoughts uh, can uh, be elevated to the creator himself and actually create something that you can bring down into this world uh, in order to create the most ideal form, the most ideal child, most ideal seed, the most ideal uh, 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 kedusha, holiness, that you possibly can. Now, as we've said, this is something that all of us can learn from because even if somebody is already pregnant and you can't get pregnant, you know, twice in the same time as the sages have taught us in the Gemara Masechet Nida, or, uh, you know, this is also for people that are already have, uh, you know, aged out and they can no longer have kids, there's still a benefit to knowing these things because even if someone cannot produce uh, any more children, any more fruits into the world, Certainly, there are different types of fruits where a person is a, uh, that has a zera kodesh, a holy seed, uh, and a holy intimate act, they're still producing holiness, just like we learned from the Zohar Kadosh that uh, all of the uh, uh, time that Avraham was with his wife, you know, decades of time where they were together and uh, no child came out of it uh, for literally nearly a hundred years, what happened with that zera? Uh, simply put, that zera was because it was done in such a holy manner, which we'll discuss tonight. Uh, that seed created all of the souls of the holy converts, the people that convert to Judaism uh, today, call themselves the uh, the sons and daughters of Avraham Avinu and Sarah, because that's actually who their father and mother is. That seed that, uh, that uh, was created at that time that created the spark of all of the neshamot. Of the converts. So, needless to say, even if a person cannot uh, uh, have kids, they could still have kids in so many words. But even if it's that kid goes, you know, to a different family. Now, the Ramban is going to go into some deep things and bear with me because this is certainly something that uh, is not, uh, not a simple subject. And he says as follows Now, I wish to awaken you a great principle and a present, a gift, a gift in the secret of how the thoughts affect the form. See here the Ramban again goes out of the norm and he tells us that this particular section is a gift. And the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 10, and also the Gemara in Masechet Beitzah, uh, page uh, 16, says that any time that you are going to, uh, you're planning on giving your fellow a gift, you need to let him know uh, ahead of time to prepare him. Just like a Kadosh Baruch Hu, uh, prepared Am Yisrael uh, for the gift of Shabbat by telling Moshe Rabbeinu, Matana gdola yesh li bebet gnazai Shabbat shma. I have a great gift uh, in my treasure chest uh, and uh, its name is Shabbat. And I'm going to give it to Am Yisrael. The gift of Shabbat was a gift exclusively to Am Yisrael. This is the reason uh, why the, uh, the Gentiles are not allowed to observe Shabbat. 
Uh, but needless to say, the, uh, the gift of Shabbat is a gift that not all Jews appreciate because not all Jews realize it's a gift. But the point being is, is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu taught us over there that before he gave us that gift, he let Moshe Rabbeinu know in order for Moshe to notify Am Yisrael of this great gift. And from there the sages teach us, if you're going to give your fellow uh, a, a gift, let them know ahead of time that you're going to give them a gift. And that's in essence what the Ramban is, uh, Nachmanides, is, a, uh, is following here. Where he's telling us he's about to teach us a principle uh, that is in itself a great gift. And this great gift is the secret of how thoughts affect the form. So it's not just the fact that thoughts affect form like we've already learned, but rather how they affect it. Our sages of blessed memory have said, in the Gemara Masechet Yoma, the thoughts of sin are worse than the sin. This is in the Masechet Yoma, page 29a. And the Ramban says, this is one of the foundations that we've discussed in the past, but again, it's, a, uh, it's something that we have to continue delving into because rationally speaking, it doesn't make sense. If the uh, thoughts of sin are worse than a sin, we're all in big trouble because many times, even if a person does not do the evil act, does not commit the sin, they, you know, more often than not, think about it. So if the thoughts of sin are worse than a sin, we are all in trouble, even if we haven't made any particular sins in our lives. So then the, uh, uh, the sages elaborate that in the Gemara in Masechet Kiddushin, page 40a, that these bad thoughts, these bad intentions that do not bear fruit, the Holy One, blessed is He, does not combine with deed, except for idolatry. As it is said by the prophet Yechezkel, chapter 14, verse 5, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart. And here I enlighten your eyes to the hidden matters in the Talmud. See, here the Ramban is telling us the thoughts of sin are worse than a sin. But don't worry about it. It's not every thought. It's not every thought that is going to be considered an actual sin. Uh, rather, if it doesn't bear fruit, if you think about something inappropriate, if you think about uh, something that uh, is forbidden, uh, it, you're not going to get a sin on your, uh, on your account unless you're thinking about idolatry. That's the one thing that even if you think about idolatry, you think about committing idolatry, you think about praying to some human being, you think about uh, doing anything that is considered idolatry, that is actually uh, punishable even if it's simply a thought, even if it does not have a, uh, it does not bear fruit because idolatry in itself, really the, the, the base of it, the foundation of it is in the mind. Uh, this is the reason why, you know, people that are Christian missionaries or all types of other idol worshipers, uh, typically they're not normal people. They're, uh, they're, you know, they're very, it's said, Gemara in Masechet, Abu Dazara says, Minut Mashcha, where in essence, when somebody is publicizing things that are sinful in order to entice people to go to idolatry or to heresy, they, in essence, uh, they can't control themselves anymore. They have to do it. They have to do it. And the, uh, uh, the thoughts of idolatry are worse uh, than, than anything you could possibly imagine. And that's why a person needs to make sure that they stay away from these things that uh, could lead you to it. But needless to say, the rest of the thoughts that a person has, if they don't bear any fruits, meaning he doesn't act on them, then it doesn't go on the sin account. But that does not mean it doesn't create damage. And that's in essence what the Ramban is going to elaborate on. Where even though, if you think about some type of immorality, if you think about something that's inappropriate, even though it doesn't count as, in essence, a sin per se, it doesn't mean that the thought doesn't create damage. So think of it this way. If somebody, you know, played with a gun and by accident they didn't realize that there's actually a bullet in the gun and they shot the gun and they just missed, they just missed the person. 
So of course, they didn't mean to shoot the gun at, their, at this person. Needless to say, they didn't want to kill anybody. But regardless of what they thought and what they intended, that bullet still created damage. It still went into something and destroyed something else. It still traumatized the person. It still, there is still damage there. So it's not something that you're typically going to punish the person for since it was an accident, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't damage created. And then the Ramban continues and he says, our ancient sages says in the Midrash Rabbah Leviticus, chapter 14, section 4, that when Ben Azai was sitting and studying Torah, a fire would blaze around him. Multiple times in the Torah, we see that when the sages studied Torah, they weren't like regular people today. Something actually would happen. Another example of this is in the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. In the second chapter, it says when Rabbi Eliezer was sitting and extrapolating in the worlds of Torah, the rays of light beaming from him were like the beams from Moshe Rabbeinu had when he came down from Mount Sinai. So here we see that the thoughts of Torah actually created something that you can see, something that is affecting reality, and not just something that's staying in the mind of these holy people. The big thing that a person must realize that when the Arizal said the, his commentary on the thoughts of sin are worse than a sin, he didn't say, he didn't re- reference to the uh, 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 idolatry, but rather he referenced to immorality, where he told us that we the thoughts of sin are worse than a sin is something that we learn from the Torah itself, from the, from the obligation to have a, uh, when you have a roof, to have some type of fence on the roof so nobody falls over. Uh, and they ask him, what is the ma'ke legegecha? What is this uh, uh, fence, if you will? He says, this ma'ke is a ma'ke that you put on your neshama, where you don't put yourself in places uh, where you could actually think of sins and in essence lead to sins themselves. Because the thought of sin is worse than a sin. Here on the positive end, we see that the thoughts of holiness by the sages created something supernatural, something out of this world, where the Ben Azai is sitting and studying Torah, and there's a mystical fire surrounding him. When Rabbi Eliezer Ben Holkinos is studying Torah, there are beams of light coming out of his face, out of his head, similar to the light that Moshe Rabbeinu had. In fact, the sages say that uh, Rabbi Eliezer was a uh, descendant of Moshe Rabbeinu. And the, uh, when Hashem promised Moshe Rabbeinu that Eliezer would be good, this is who he was referring to. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Chagiga, page 15, over there, the Tosfot, says that the teacher of Rabbi Meir Balanes was a person by the name of Elisha ben Avuya. Elisha ben Avuya at one point was one of the great sages, a Tana, but he went off. He used Kabbalah, was not able to handle it, and he completely lost his mind and started making many sins. But before he did that, the Gemara says, how does somebody that gets to such a high level of spirituality get to such a low level of spirituality? He says it all started with his Brit Milah, where his father was an important person and he invited some of the great sages to honor him in his Brit Milah of his uh, celebration of his son, of his newborn son, Elisha. And the sages saw that there is some time, uh, you know, t- before the actual Brit Milah will take place. So they uh, started, they sat down and they started learning to uh, and they were at such a high level that suddenly a spiritual fire came down from heaven and started literally surrounding them. When Avuya, the, the father of Elisha, saw this, 
He said to them, are you here to destroy my house? Burn my house down? And they said, no, not to worry. This is a spiritual fire. This is a holy fire that we get as a result of delving into the words of, of Hashem, the words of Torah. And he says, oh, if that's the case, then I am going to dedicate my son to learn Torah. And from there, the Gemara says, this was the bad seed, where Avuya, the father of Elisha, didn't put Elisha in yeshiva and in kolel and in the world of Torah because he wanted him to be a holy person, because he loved Hashem, because he uh, wanted him to be, uh, you know, a, uh, someone that helps people. No, no. He wanted to get the honor that comes as a result of becoming a big sage. And that, in essence, was a bad seed. That was a bad uh, intention. That was part of the reason of why Elisha himself said was the reason why uh, he always had these, in essence, evil intentions within him that eventually broke him and steered him to the wrong direction. But from there again, we see that the sages are delving into what's called Kabbalah Ma'asit or uh, into Ma'asim Merkava, uh, which is delving into the uh, dealings of the upper world. And something is created, something that not only they can see, but rather something that anybody can see, a spiritual fire. The Gemara in Masechet Megillah says that when Yonatan ben Uziel would study Torah, the holiness from his learning would be so extraordinary that any bird that would fly over him would literally burn and become like a sacrifice, become like a korban. So to that extent, now, was it only when they delved into the deepest uh, parts of the Torah, the Maaseh Merkava, Maaseh Bereshit, all of these uh, you know, extraordinary levels of Kabbalah? No. The Midrash Rabba Shira Shirim says that some of these sages were so holy that even when they delved into the basics of the Torah, where they would go into the five books of Moses and review it, or into the Nevi'im, the prophets, or the writings and just delved into it, that would already create some of these spiritual fires uh, around them. You would already see the same cons- the same thing being created as a result of it. And this, in essence, is one of the places where the Ramban is telling you, yes, we have documented history where we can actually see what is created by a thought. Because that's what learning Torah is. You're thinking you know, sometimes your thoughts are verbalized and sometimes they're not. But needless to say, something is created. On the positive end, we see that the holy sages, and needless to say, Moshe Rabbeinu and some of the, you know, and the forefathers, which we'll discuss in a, in a few moments, their thoughts created something. Something that anybody can see. You didn't have to be very holy to see it. So they cre- their thoughts created a reality they formed something and you must know says the Ramban that all of these things had one meaning to them and I will explain this to you know that though a spring of water naturally flows from a high place to a low one there is a power capable of raising the water to a different place higher than where where it flowed from It is known by the masters of Kabbalah that the thought of man comes from the spiritual source of the rational soul, which is drawn from the upper spheres, the world of souls. And there is power in the thought to expand and rise and reach its highest source. And upon arriving at its source, it can adhere to the upper secret from whence it came and the two, meaning the thought and the thinker become one so here the Ramban is in essence giving us the basic goal of somebody going into the world of Kabbalah where they delve into something called a Yichud a Yichud is unifying a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name now when a person sanctifies their mind 
purifies it from all physicality. They're not thinking about the pain that they have. They're not thinking about the troubles they're dealing with. They're not thinking about their wife and kids. They're not thinking about money. They completely separate the, the thought from anything physical. They can elevate that thought to a higher place. And in essence, what the Ramban is telling you is you can use an analogy where just like every town, at least in the previous generations, would have a water tower. And the water tower would typically be on a mountain or at a very high point. And the reason why they did this is because they wanted to have, you know, the water, the way that Hashem created the world, is while the water is very high, it's not that there's somebody always next to it that needs to drink over there. But rather, because it is very high, it gave the water the ability to actually travel down, but also go back up to the same level. So think of it as a, uh, if you have, let's say, a... Uh, a pipe that goes down straight. Let's just compare it to, let's say, an L. If you have a pipe like that and you drop the water from there, the water will go to the bottom and, in essence, wherever it levels out. But it's not going to rise. If you connect it to, uh, uh, to another one that's a uh, parallel to it, nothing is going to happen usually. But if you make it in such a shape similar to a U, where there's some type of connection between the two and you, then you pour the water that water now has an ability to not just go down like the original pipe that we discussed that goes straight down and stays down but rather now it has the ability to go down and go right back up to the same level or even higher than where it started from there, the Ramban is telling us that if a person separates themselves from their physicality and allows their thoughts, their mind, to go to a higher place, they're certainly going to be able to achieve something extraordinary. But how would somebody be able to get their thought to a higher place that's because the mind is already connected to the source that created it above so it's already connected to the source above and therefore it's using the natural laws that hashem created the same concept as the water that it was already created in the upper worlds it's now gone down to him but once he separates from the body, from the physicality that's pulling him down, he can literally allow his thoughts to go right back up to the source. To the source. Now, why would anybody want to do such a thing? Says the Ramban that the masters of Kabbalah said that the thoughts of man come from the spiritual source of the rational soul, which is drawn from the upper spheres, the world of souls, and there is power in the thought to expand and rise and reach its highest source. And upon arriving at its source, it can adhere to the upper secret from whence it came, and the two, the thought and the thinker, become one. The goal of doing such a thing is to do what's called a yichud, where you are unifying the thought with the source of the thought. And in essence, creating a single entity as they combine that is creating something divine. Hashem said to us in the Torah, in Sefer Bereshit, that uh, uh, He wanted to create us in His image. Now, of course, Hashem doesn't have an image, doesn't have a likeness of an image, He's not a human being, but He gave us uh, uh, instructions over there where we're going to know the difference between right and wrong, but also we're going to be able to tell anybody else that sees us that He's our Father because we have some likeness to Him. 
Just like if you see a child and then you see their parent, you can match the child with the parent usually because they have a likeness in, in physicality. Here Hashem says there is no physicality to Hashem, but there is going to be a resemblance between His creation and the Creator itself, where you, that, that creation can also think and thereby create. Your thoughts can actually create because Hashem is one. So therefore, the past, the present, and the future are all the same to Him. There is no past, present, and future for Hashem. It's all the same. He's in the past and the present and the future all at the same time. Being one also means that His thoughts and His actions are one and the same. There is no separation between them like there is with us where we are typically our thoughts are separate from us. Here, even though our thoughts are typically separate from us, he gave us the ability to elevate our thoughts and unite them with the source and in essence unite the thought and the source itself. And thereby be privied to the upper secrets, the things that are happening above and the power that a person can get once they have access to that special divine light. Now, the Ramban continues and says, and when the thought returns below from above, it all becomes similar to a single ray. And that supernal light is drawn downward and the power of that thought that draws it downward and the Shekhinah is found below and, the, and then the light of luminescence, the, the, the Or Elyon, the upper light, is drawn and spread out in that place where that thinking person is. This is how the early Hasidim, the early pious ones, would cause their thoughts to adhere to the upper worlds and would draw down the upper lights and thereby the matters be growing, multiplying in power of thought. Now, I know this is a handful for most of us, if not all of us. Many people have seen at least, if not the imagery, maybe even have heard some people talk about the upper worlds. In the world of Kabbalah, there are different types of uh, these upper worlds. The uh, Rav, um, Rav Kaduri was a famous Kabbalist, one of the great ones of his, uh, of his time, and there was a Sefer that uh, was published with many of his writings, but in there, there is a section by Rav Adis. Rav Adis is a very big Mekubal and uh, is an extraordinary Talmud Chacham, and his section in that Sefer, that's by Rav Kaduri, the section by Rav Adis is how to perform miracles. That's what the whole section is about. How to perform miracles. How, in essence, to change reality. How to change the nature. And the whole section is based on this particular foundation that we're learning right now. Now, you have different types of worlds, if you will. You have the four worlds of uh, Atzilut, Bria, Yetzirah, and Asiya. And you also have the ten Sfirot. Anyone that saw those, uh, it looks like uh, some type of a uh, hexagram where you have the ten Sfirot, it has different names, on them, uh, these are in essence the uh, not to be confused with ten different parts of God. Chas v'shalom. These are not ten different parts, but rather these are ten different midot, ten different qualities and traits of a kadosh baruch Hu that are united. They're all Him, and when a person uses those properly, they're supposed to combine them in their mind. So, similar to how, let's say, for example, if a person wants to combine 
uh, you know, floors in a building. Or, you know, you want to combine floors, you want to combine levels. So you would combine, you know, the foundational level to the upper level, to the upper level, to the upper level. Rather than combining downwards, you're combining upwards. So when a person knows how to use uh, the, these types of teachings, these types of Kabbalah, they're in essence, they're separating from the physicality. They're leaving their, their in essence, their body separates from their soul to a, you know to a certain extent they're elevating themselves and throughout that whole process they're thinking about either the, the four worlds or they're thinking about the uh, the ten sfirot or they could even think about shema israel hashem elokeinu hashem echad where the whole point of any of the thoughts that you're going to have even if you think let's say enod milvado there's nothing else but him all of them have one common denominator, which is unifying the name of God, unifying God, never ever thinking for a moment that there is parts to God, chas v'shalom, or that there is an outside power aside from God, or anything that would separate God in any way. This is the reason why the Trinity in Christianity is idol worship, or, or even people that uh, sometimes delve into the world of Kabbalah that are not qualified, they go crazy. Uh, sometimes they become complete idol worshippers and, and heretics. Other times they literally go crazy and have to be instituted because a person has to have a certain level of neshama, of pure neshama, in order to delve into these things. But the point is that when a person does do that, there, the whole goal, the whole common denominator between all of the different Yehudim, all of the different unification thoughts, is to unify the name of God with the different aspects that He taught us about Him, the different qualities that He has. And the same concept with unifying the worlds that He created. Now, When the thoughts and the source of the thought, the thought you have here and the source, the upper heavens, the source above, unites, that's in essence a yichud. And as the Ramban is telling us, as that lower thought is using that power of the upper light that's already there, that's connected to you, to raise it back up there, sort of like a U, if you will. Or you could even see it's a beam of light, but in essence, the way it works, as the Ramban is explaining, is almost like a U, like water. You're connecting now to this upper light. And the goal of doing that is once a person gets to that light, depending on their level and how far their light is, and, you know, some serious Kabbalist can even navigate the worlds. They know exactly where to go, that world, where to stay away from, where there's danger, where there's certain things that you can see. Uh, you know, it's, it's a whole uh, teaching and, and, and world of its own, or many worlds of its own. But the point being is, is that the Ramban is telling us that once a person connects to that upper light, based on whatever level they were able to reach, they can now pull down that light. And that light is the blessing. That light is the supernatural. That light is the divine gift that Hashem is giving you that can allow you to do things, allow you to know things, allow you to connect to things that otherwise are not possible. And you pull down this light into this world. So, for example, I'm sure that some of you have heard some of these shirim that say superficially uh, or really don't delve into it because it's not really uh, uh, something that most people would understand uh, that, uh, you know, when people ask, what did Hashem do before He created this world? Now, if you listen to heretics, they'll say stupid things that they're just simply creating while they're talking that he needed us and that, that, he, that he, uh, he was lonely and all types of dumb things. But if you look at the holy sages, you'll see that they're telling you that Hashem created worlds and destroyed them. 
What does that mean that Hashem created worlds and destroyed them? Now, when we hear the, the, the simple language created worlds and destroyed them, it makes us think of worlds like what we have, where there's people and they're they're all, you know, they're eating lunch together and they're 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 uh, they're going to work and they're watching some screen and uh, they're they're flying in the air. Maybe they're more advanced than us, and then people start thinking about aliens and all types of other stuff. This is not what it's talking about. Created worlds and destroyed them is in essence this connection to the light where these worlds that Hashem created, they had this light, this light was utilized for something, this godly light was uh, was utilized for something, and then Hashem destroyed it by either there was no reason for it to exist anymore, or that there was, it gave the uh, creation of a new light. There's also other types of worlds where the it's hard for people to understand, and I heard an extraordinary explanation by Talmit Chacham Rav Meir Eliyahu that when people talk about uh, you know the the uh, upper worlds, heaven, hell, uh, it's it's a uh, you know at, at first uh, uh, glance, or even for for a person that's even learning for many years, it's. Uh, easy for them to understand Gehenna, but it's very difficult for them to understand heaven. This is the reason why there is a lot more writing about punishment than there is writing about and teachings about heaven. When they teach you about Gehenna, they teach you about suffering, teach you about punishment, they teach you about things that we are all familiar with to a certain extent. Some of us more or less than others, but the point is, is that everyone is familiar with pain, something that can inflict pain, uh, something dangerous. So suffering is something that is a part of the world we already live in, and therefore telling you that there's even greater suffering for those that go against God is understandable. And in fact, this is one of the things that's necessary for a person to connect to the real God of Israel, to know that there is a life after life, and there are options there where there's either reward or there's punishment. But when people start thinking about heaven, it's very hard for them to understand because the simple uh, uh, Gemara that talks about it says, what, is, you know, what are the uh, tzaddikim doing in heaven? It says, oh, they're learning Torah. Now, of course, a person that's not learning Torah or at least not making Torah their priority in this world, that doesn't sound to them like heaven. Why would I want to read a book for eternity? Doesn't sound like heaven. Tell me I'm going to go to, you know, have some palace with a bunch of slaves, you know, eat food without getting fat, uh, you know, do all types of things that a person is connected to in this world. Physicality. But the upper worlds are, are, are not in the same concept as this, but there is an upper world. And in fact, in the upper worlds, in the heaven, there is a things that are similar to this world. Some people think, oh yeah, when you're in the upper world, you're like some type of little ghost, some spirit. And that's not true. In fact, in heaven, there is, you have a body over there, you actually eat, you have a, your, your spouse, the same one that you were with here, so you better have shalom bayit in this world because you're stuck with each other forever anyway. There's a certain amount of time that you're together every day. You learn Torah, you eat, a, uh, there is a uh, uh, animals over there. There's a lot of different things that in, eff- in essence are exactly what you see in this world. Only difference is they don't look like the things that you see in this world because they over there in the upper heavens, they are at their pure form. They're at their real form of what they truly were created as and not as the impression of what they are. So for example... You know, the animals, for example, uh, here, you you know, when you think of a lion, you think of some beast that, uh, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to see on a dark alley and you don't want to get stuck in a cage with them. And you certainly don't want to smell them because they usually smell terrible like all animals. Same thing with a pig, same thing with all the other animals. They all have all types of smell and people that work with animals, you know, get desensitized to these things. But anyone that goes to a zoo or goes to a... Uh, 
uh, any type of farm has an adjustment period to, to what's going on over there. In the upper worlds, it's not the same. In the upper worlds, these creatures are mystical creatures, in essence. They, to us, it would look like a mystical creature where they have wings, they fly, they're completely beautiful. They are able to do things that are completely irrelevant to this world. And in fact, the way that it works, in essence, this, this whole concept of Hashem uh, creating worlds and destroying them, is that there is the original light that Hashem, in essence, that's, that's, that's Hashem, that Hashem created this light. But this light was too spiritual. To make things simpler, think of it as this world. The world that he original created was too spiritual to be physical, to be connected to physical. And in order to downgrade it to the physicality of this world, it wasn't something that he did in one step, but rather he had the original world and then he had impressions of that world and another impressions of the next world. Another impression of the next world, and each time there's an impression, there is, uh, it's not the same beauty as the original. What is it like if you have, let's say, a stamp? Okay, you take a stamp and you stamp something. Now, don't refill it with with uh, with ink again. Leave the same stamp and stamp again. The second stamp is slightly lighter than the first stamp. Stamp again. The third stamp is certainly lighter than the first stamp. Do it again, it's even lighter. Now, you could still tell it's of the same you know, place, but it doesn't look the same. And the more times you stamp, the more there's a significant difference between the original stamp impression and what you have now. That's in essence the world we are in being the last stamp as somewhat of a resemblance, but not anywhere near the same as the original stamp, the original light. Now, when a person connects to this upper light, to the source, not the stamp, not the last stamp, but the higher they connect themselves, the higher the world they connect their thought to, it could be the fourth stamp or the third stamp or the second, you know, you, you get the point. The higher they connect themselves to, the more, the stronger the light that they're connected to and they're able to bring down. And once they bring down this light with them, as the water goes back down, they're bringing things that are not of this world, that are not, they're natural things in that world, there are normal things in that world, but they're not normal in this world, in this impression of a world. And this is how, says the Ramban, we explain the secret of the miracle of the jug of olive oil of Elisha Navi that he gave to the widow of the prophet Ovadia or of the canister of flour and the bottle of oil of Eliyahu Navi, that's in the book of Kings 2, chapter 4, where there was an evil king, Ahav, that had an even more evil wife, and Izevil, and she was on a mission to kill the Jewish prophets. Now, one of the ministers of Ahav was a righteous goy, named Ovadia. And he knew that his master was evil. He knew that his, uh, the, the, uh, the wife was even more evil. And he knew that the prophets of Am Yisrael were holy. And he decided to take on the mission of hiding them. And he got two caves where he hid a hundred prophets. Now, of course, he didn't hide them for just a day. He hid them for a long period of time, which meant that he had to feed them. He had to support them. And for that, he had to borrow money from the son of Ahav, who didn't care, even though he knew his father would kill 
Ovadia, his, 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 uh, his servant, if he found out that he's actually, in essence, committing treason here and he's working against him, he didn't care. He was uh, a, a person that just cared about money. So he was getting money by doing this. How? By lending money to Ovadia at high interest. And Ovadia had a good job. So he said, listen, I work for your father. Eventually I'll pay you. And this is actually how he saved 100 prophets. This was such an extraordinary act that a Kadosh Baruch Hu was so happy with Ovadia that he actually made him into a prophet. But the day came and Ovadia himself passed away. But the debt that he owned, the son of Ahab, was still outstanding. And the son of Ahab came to the uh, widow of Ovadia, as the Tanakh says, and demanded the money. And she said, I don't have, we're poor. He says, okay, fine, if you don't have the money, simple, I'll take the kids and turn them into my slave. Now, of course, the widow of Ovadia cried, cried to Hashem, how could this be? My... Uh, my husband saved your prophets and this is how uh, I'm going to suffer as a result of it. My sons are going to turn into slaves. Hashem sent her Elisha Navi. Elisha came and he told her, don't worry, go and get yourself pots. Get yourself a pot of oil. Just a little bit. And get as many pots as you can. Now, this was a simple woman that she knew that the Navi was holy. So they got as many pots as possible. They borrowed from everybody, from the whole neighborhood. They borrowed the pots. They got a bunch of different pots. And miraculously, each one of these pots was full of oil. So much so that they became wealthy and they were able to pay back this debt. Now, the Ramban says, how did Elisha and Navi do this? How do you make oil come from nothing? How do you make, in his, uh, his rabbi's uh, perspective, Eliyahu Navi, how do you make flour, a canister of flour and a bottle of oil? Like, how do you make these things come from nothing? This is because they sanctified their thoughts, connected them to the upper heavens, to that light, where these types of things are in essence standard where the supernatural is simply natural and brought it back down to the natural world where this divine thought that materialized into something form it was able to materialize into endless form because a divine is endless it's 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 a it's infinite so it didn't matter how many canisters they had there was no end to it it didn't matter how many things they needed, they could replicate it with no end. And says the Ramban, and because the matters are such, our sages had to say that when a man has union with his wife and his thoughts adhere to the upper worlds, that very thought draws the upper light downward and it envelopes that drop of seed which he is concentrating upon and thinking of. This is like the jug of oil of Elisha's miracle. And so it comes about that this drop is bound to the light of the divine luminescence, the Orabail. And this is the secret of what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 1, verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I already knew you. For the light of luminescence has already been joined to the drop of that righteous man, the father of Jeremiah, at the time of union. Because the thought that he had was joined with the higher spheres and it draws this light of luminescence downwards. Understand this well. See here, the Ramban goes back to our subject at hand as far as how one can see this 
in their day-to-day -day life. Now I know that all of you, if not most of you, are saying right now, okay, fine, thank you very much, but how is it? I can't do any of this stuff. I can't connect. I can barely separate myself from thinking about coffee. I can barely separate myself from thinking about uh, cigarettes. I can barely think of myself, uh, you know, separate myself from thinking about my portfolio, my job, or my wife, or something. You want me to completely separate from my body and then on, on top of that elevate to the highest fears? I understand. Don't worry. In the end, every single person is going to understand a point that they, they can actually take home. But here we see that these holy sages and these prophets and these holy people that are in our Torah had the knowledge of how to connect to these upper worlds, how to connect to this upper light, and in so many words, create the most holy people already from the act of unity, where the father of Jeremiah was such a holy person that he was able to use this during the time of unity, during a time of intimacy with his wife, to elevate his thoughts to the upper heavens, and therefore creating this connection between the light and himself and his thoughts that he's imprinting into the seed. And therefore that seed created one of the holiest people that ever lived, which is the prophet Jeremiah. Someone that saw the dest destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, someone that we read a lot about. And this Hashem said to him, I already knew about you. At the time, you are a seed already. Not because of Hashem's infinite knowledge, but rather because of the action of your father. When he connected, he unified his thoughts to the upper light and brought it down and imprinted it on his seed that's what that was the outcome you are the outcome of an extraordinary life of righteousness but specifically one particular act now the ramban continues and says and understand from this the great secret of the matter of the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, the God of Yaakov. Meaning, we always say each day in our prayers, in our Amidah prayers, three times a day, anytime that we uh, refer to Am Yisrael in the Torah, it's constantly referring to them as the uh you know that uh referring to hashem we're, we're referring to our connection to our forefathers Abraham, Yitzhak, and yaakov but it doesn't say the god of yaron it doesn't say the god of shmuel it doesn't say the god of uh of uh you know regular people today but it does say god of Abraham, Yitzhak, and yaakov our forefathers what made them so special now of course if you read the tanakh you read Sefer Bereshit, you see all of the major tests that they went through, and you understand the, the, the meaning behind it, the story behind the story. Certainly, they went through an extraordinary amount of uh, 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 tests, and they overcame it, whether it's the Akedah of Avraham Avinu and Yitzchak, or it's the life of uh, difficulty that Yaakov lived. But still, a person that's either ignorant or oblivious can still say, okay, but I still don't understand what made them so special. Now, the Ramban is going to tell us, why are, we, why are they so special that forevermore, Hashem decreed that it will be referred to as the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov? What made them so special? He says, understand this great secret. This secret is that their thoughts, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, were never separated from the upper light for even one hour or even one minute. So we find that the forefathers were like servants purchased by the master in perpetuity. And therefore it is said, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, and the God of Yaakov. So here we're seeing something truly extraordinary, unbelievable, because if you ask the average person, 
What do you think? Can you separate your thoughts from your body? You know, some people call it meditation, but it's much, much bigger than simply meditation. This is outer body experience, elevating yourself. It's, it's, it's much, much deeper, much more, more extraordinary. And also a, uh, an act of holiness, whereas a person that is doing things otherwise could actually reach uh, places that they don't want to be in, where they could actually uh, get hurt by, uh, by these types of things. Sometimes a person will meditate and start thinking of very inappropriate things, very disgusting things, uh, forbidden things. Uh, so it's a... Uh, in fact, the, uh, if a person is not spiritually suitable uh, to elevate their, uh, themselves to the upper worlds and they try, uh, many times they could actually get hurt by it, by having all of these klipot attack them. Uh, and uh, instead of them reaching a, a upper level of holiness, they're actually going to reach idolatry, heresy, znut, uh, you know, immorality, all types of you know, horrible things. So... So far, I'm, this is not instructions of, for you guys to do at home. This is simply to learn and get rewarded for the sake of learning, but then we're going to get to the point of where it affects all of us. Here the Ramban is telling us the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu is named as the God of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov is because they were nothing like anybody else. Where anybody else, if you tell them to separate from their physicality, even if they're a holy person, they could separate for a moment of time after separation, after after preparation. They could do it for you know some time. You know some of the righteous people could do it for you know for, for hours even, but uh, it's not a normal thing and it's not a daily thing. The avot, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the Ramban is saying. They were like that their whole life. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, over you know, 86,000 seconds. All of it was constantly connected to the upper light at all times, throughout their whole lives. So now the natural question is, how do they function? How do they function and eat and drink? How do they learn Torah? How do they do anything? And don't worry, you're not the only one that asked this question. In fact, the sages themselves asked and answered that question. And it is told that even when they were involved, when Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov were involved with food, drink, conjugal relations, and other bodily functions, they were adhered to God. Literally 24 hours a day, they were constantly connected to God through this highest possible level. And our sages in the Gemara, in Masechet Brachot, page 35b, found this hard to fathom when they said, if this is so, when did they have time to learn Torah? Were the words of Torah neglected by them? And the answer to this, says the Ramban, is that in all of these bodily matters, whether it's food, drink, conjugal relations, any other bodily function, the intentions of the Avot were always for the sake of heaven. And therefore their thoughts were never separated from the upper light, even for a single moment. And due to this, Yaakov, Allah Shalom, was able to bring the 12 tribes to the world. He was the father of the 12 tribes who were all completely righteous, upright men. All of them were worthy of being in the image of the divine world order, bearers of the Lord's vessels. For their thoughts were not separated from being adhered above, even at the time of marital union. Here we see something truly unbelievable explained where because each one of their thoughts was constantly connected to that source, everything that they did 
was something that they would connect to God with. They would unify the name of God through it. Now, to explain this, they once asked Arav Kuk from Tveria, from Tiberias. He's a big mekubal, extraordinary Talmud Chacham. And they asked him, what kavana, what yichud, what do you do when you want to drink coffee? You just want to drink coffee. Like, how do you sanctify drinking coffee? Okay, you want to do a blessing, fine. So Rav Kook says, to drink coffee, he says, first of all, you don't make it like people do. Where you put the coffee in, then you put the water in. No. You have to make it in a certain way, and you have to consume it in a certain way. You make it where you pour some water, then you put some coffee, and then you put some more water. Why? Because the water is symbolic of chesed. The coffee is symbolic of deen, of judgment. And then the water again is again symbolic of chesed, and therefore you have that mercy is covering the judgment from the top and the bottom. And when you consume it, when you drink it, always drink it Two sips at a time. Never one sip. Always two sips at a time. Why? Because the word kafe, the word for coffee in Hebrew is kafe. That's kuf, fe, he. The numerical value is 185. And when you drink two kafe, two sips of kafe, you have now 370. This 370 is representative of the 370 lights of the upper heavens. There's a section of where there's 370 lights. That's how you connect to them. In so many words, the average person, the drink, you know, they make coffee. First thing they think about, make it quick. Second thing they think about, make sure it's sweet. Third thing they think about is like, ah, oh, come on, no, you didn't make it good. That's what people think about. What connection to the upper world? What the water and the and the coffee and the three ways of doing it? What are you talking about? I just want coffee. It's morning, I'm tired. Just want coffee. No problem. You can have coffee. But if a person wants to connect every single act that they do in this world to Akadosh Baruch Hu and literally sanctify even the mundane. There is a way to do everything with these different kavanot in order to unify the name of God with His creation, with your actions, with everything. Now, this is what Shlomo HaMelech Shalom, meant in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, says the Ramban, when he said, that in all your ways know him what does it mean all your ways know him the Gemara in Masechet Brachot page 63a says our sages of blessed memory taught us that in all your ways know him is referring to even in all of your physical doings small or great and know him as you already know, says the Ramban, the usage of no in the Torah is, is referring to the union between a man and his wife. A union and a clinging of the rational soul to the upper light, as the union of a man to his wife is called no, so is the cleaving of the spirit to the upper world of the rational intellect, also called no. You already know that someone is said to know an item only when the cognitive soul is united with the object of knowledge. Understand this well. So up to here is all an introduction. Everything I just read to you, which I, Baruch Hashem, cannot believe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Help me to do this all in one shiur. I thought it's going to take five hours or five shiurim. 
All of this is an introduction to an important concept. Now don't worry, that concept is not going to take as long. The concept itself is literally one paragraph. But all of this, says the Ramban, who was a master of Kabbalah nearly 300 years before the Arizal. The Arizal, which from him we learn endless amount of Kabbalah from, he's the one that uh, taught the world what uh, the Zohar means and what uh, all of these different things mean. But he wasn't the first. There were obviously other Kabbalists that preceded him, as we mentioned already, and one of them was the Ramban. The Ramban is telling us that this Yichud is a godly thought. This Yichud is a connection of your thought to the upper heavens in order to bring down a light that could literally change reality. If and it's you know obviously at a, at a high power, but even at a lower power, could imprint a holy neshama into the seed that you are creating. Could actually fix parts of this world that need fixing, or else the Mashiach cannot come, which Bezat Hashem will talk about one day. There are certain sparks of Kedusha that need to be collected in the world. This is part of the reason why Hashem sent us in the desert in this week's parasha to all of these places. It's also to collect certain Kedusha, certain sparks of Kedusha. It's also the reason why we had to go in in Egypt. The point is that a person can elevate themselves, has the ability to elevate themselves through their mind, through their thoughts, to the upper heavens, connect to this ultimate light, to the source of everything, and bring down this into the world. Imprint it on a seed. Imprint it on something that's going to become a reality. Now I know that to most people, this is perhaps interesting, but impossible. They are well too connected to the physicality of the world when they are intimate they want to feel to see to do you're talking to a wall no problem this too affects you why because while HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the ability to unify His name, which one of the greatest privileges that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave Am Yisrael is the ability to say His name. Now, most people don't really understand what that means. In fact, I learn, and Bezat Hashem one day will truly understand what that means. But one of the greatest privileges that Hashem gave us is simply to have the ability to say, to, to connect them, to say His name. And we say it in, in, a, uh, in our prayers. We say it when we learn Torah. That in itself is a greater privilege than any of the physicality and materialism that a person can possibly want. But the average person doesn't understand that. And I can tell you that that thought in itself took me no less than 10 years to even think about. When a person thinks of the morning blessings, usually they look at them from a superficial place where the morning blessings for the Jewish people is we thank Hashem, we thank Hashem for different things, we thank Hashem for providing us dry land where we can live on. Where we say, um, Now, when a person thinks about it, okay, so there's land. We can live there. Why I have to think about it every day? 
Not really sure. Until a person learns a little bit, they'll understand that the fact that there is land at all is a miracle. Because the original creation that Hashem made was the whole world was full of water. And then he forced the soil, the rocks, to come out of the water and float. And that's in essence what it is. All of the continents that are there are not something to simply ignore or take for granted, but in fact are something that we really, when we think about it, says the Ben Ishchai, we should be thanking Hashem for it every second. Because at any moment, the ocean is threatening to drown the water, to drown the, uh, the, the, the rocks. Why? Because in a natural order of things, if you take a bowl or, or some type of canister of water, and you throw a rock in there, you throw some soil in there, what's going to happen to it? It's all going to sink to the bottom. It's not going to float. But that's exactly what we have in the world. We have a bunch of land floating. And a Kadosh Baruch Hu does that for us every single second. When a person understands the meaning behind the morning blessings, they can start getting closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and understand that, wow, if I took these things for granted, what else am I taking for granted? We say to Hashem, thank you Hashem, that you released us from being tied up. What tied up? When we were sleeping, we weren't really in control of our body. And the sages equate it to being tied up by chains. So when a person wakes up and is able to move around, he must thank Hashem for no longer being tied up in chains. And there's many, many other things that one can learn about even the simple things of your day-to-day -day life. Needless to say, that a person can learn some of the higher end, some of the higher level teachings of Kabbalah that even though you can't do it, even though you can't even connect to it or understand it, there is a lesson to be learned. And what is that lesson? Says the Ramban, all of this was the introduction, all of this was the introduction. What's the introduction? What is the introduction? How is the introduction? Says Rabbi Chaim Ivolojin in the Sefer Nefesh Achaim, chapter Dalit, 4. When a Jew thinks, thinks of something immoral, he thinks of some pornography, he thinks of some nakedness, he thinks of something inappropriate, that is much worse than what Titus Imach Shimo did with the harlot where he took her in the Kodesh Kodeshim and did what he did over there. How? Titus did an act, a vile act, a disgusting act, a horrific act. How could that possibly be? Nothing in comparison to one thought of immorality that a Jew has. He says, because a Kadosh Baruch Hu created that Jew with special access, special access to the ultimate light, a direct connection to that ultimate light, the ability to unify Hashem's name the ability to connect your thoughts with the source of the thoughts and literally create a godly thought, something that is one. The ability to bring the heavens to earth. And therefore, that mind that Jew has, 
That is that private room between a husband and wife. And when that husband does the most vile things right in front of his wife, there is simply no worse embarrassment, no worse desecration, no worse act than that can be. When a wife cheats on her husband right in front of him, there is nothing worse that she could ever do or say than that. When a Jew thinks of immorality, when he thinks about the filth that he saw on TV and the internet, when he thinks about all types of forbidden things, that's like the wife cheating on the husband and he's the only one that can see it. Instead of using that mind to unify a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name, instead of using that mind to connect to the source, a person is using it for the most horrific things. Titus, he wasn't created to be able to do such things. He is physical. He is material. This is what he can do. He doesn't have a private connection to Hashem. He's no different than some beast. And therefore, the thoughts of sin are worse than a sin. And says the Ramban that all of this was the introduction. So we consider the well, the secret of saying that in all of your ways know him. As this verse is a juxtaposition of, and he will direct our path, as it says in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6. Because the upper light adheres to what he does. And all his doings will be in the proper order and remain extent. This is what our sages said in Pirkei Avot chapter 2 verse 12. And your deeds will be for the sake of heaven. And now that we have informed you of this, consider it well, says the Ramban, and see why a man's thoughts of transgression are worse than the actual deed. This is due to the fact that when a man thinks in the ways of evil and sullies his soul and his filthy thoughts rise to and sully the upper worlds, wherein is the quarry from the whence of the souls are extracted, then the soul is in debt to heaven because he defiled it with his touch, with the touch of his thoughts, However, if he sinned in this world and his judgment did not reach the heavenward, the judgment will be less serious than when he had an improper thought that adheres to the upper spheres, to the upper worlds, which is similar to cutting down the plantings, meaning heresy, as was said of Elisha Acher, Elisha Ben Avuya. And from this we can understand the secret of a person who has sinful thoughts at the time of union. For this filthy thought defiles the drop and brings forth an evil, wicked, and filthy foundation called strangers. And you will understand this well if you are a sensitive soul. Here the Ramban tells us the ultimate point of all of this. He's obviously well aware that perhaps his own Talmud that he wrote it to understood and was even able to apply all of this to his life. But other people that would learn this are not going to be able to apply all of it or even half of it. And therefore, there is the ultimate point. Although we can't all connect our thoughts to the upper light, Although we can't even separate our thoughts from our physicality, although we can't even understand what this means, we can all understand and agree that the thoughts are not just thoughts. That the sages have shown us the thoughts do create a reality. And in fact, a reality that is men- that's mentioned countless times in the Torah, 
in the Nevi'im, in the Ketuvim, in the Gemara, in the Zohar. Even in today's world, you can see certain things that are supernatural. The thoughts certainly do create a reality. Now, although a person may not understand, may not know how, may not be able to bring themselves to do any part of this holy steps, what the Ramban is pleading for, what a Kadosh Baruch Hu is pleading for, is that at least don't ruin it. You may not be able to elevate your soul, your thoughts to the upper world and sanctify yourself at the highest levels. Fine. It's not a sin not to be able to get to the highest worlds. But it is horrible. Horrible sin when we desecrate those thoughts. When instead of elevating them and creating something holy, we think of immorality. We think of filth at the time of intimacy where instead of thinking about how much he loves his wife, instead of thinking about how much she loves her husband, they're each thinking about how somebody else looks like. They're each thinking about someone they saw on some television screen or in the office or in the streets. They're each thinking about some conversation or phone call or message they got from somebody. Meaning, okay, you can't think in such a fashion where you could sanctify Hashem's name by uniting it. You can't even think Shema Yisrael. No problem. But why are you thinking about somebody that's not your wife? Why are you thinking of somebody that's not your husband? Don't you understand how much damage it's causing? If you didn't, now you do. Because, as the Ramban said, those thoughts either connect the upper worlds through that light to hear, or those thoughts defile those worlds, destroy those worlds, destroy the connection to those worlds. And therefore, the Ramban says, his life is on the line even for that simple thought. He's in debt with his life for that thought during what was supposed to be a holy act. He turned it into an animalistic act. He turned it into a perverted act. She turned it into something disgusting in the eyes of our Father in Heaven. What will you do when your Father in Heaven is looking at you and shows you what you thought about at that time, and your husband is there to listen and watch. What will you do when your husband finds out in the upper heavens and you're being judged that each time you were together you were thinking about some fireman, you were thinking about the clerk from the supermarket, you were thinking about when you were young and you had a boyfriend. You were thinking about all types of perverted things. What will you do when your husband is there to watch it and a Kadosh Baruch Hu is there to show it to you? What will you do when a Kadosh Baruch Hu shows you your wife and kids as he's showing all of them what you thought about? When you were with their mother creating those kids and their defective neshamot, what will you do during that day? Other than cry and beg Hashem to go to Gehenna. Rabotai, it's not supposed to be a scary shiu, but reality is sometimes scary. It's not supposed to be a shiur that's going to get every one of you to become a Kabbalist and think the highest level of thoughts even when you drink coffee. But it is intended to, at the very least, help each and every single one of us aspire not to have filthy thoughts, and at the very least, 
aspire to think about our loved one, our spouse, during that time of intimacy and nothing else. If you can do that, that's already an upgrade from where most people are. If you can do more, certainly, that's amazing. But don't worry if you can't do more. Just do what's expected of you so you don't embarrass yourself when you get to the Bet Din of Shemaim. And the light is so dark because you've been dimming it and destroying it your whole life with every act. Bezat Hashem, each and every single one of us will have the strength to elevate ourselves, to remind ourselves that yes, we can do more. We can be more. We can expect more from ourselves and focus on ourselves more than we focus on others. And as we elevate ourselves in these holy acts, HaKadosh Baruch Hu would also give us the power and ability and wherewithal to elevate others along with us. Thank you very much for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every single one of you and give each one of you the siyat dishmaya that you need to elevate yourselves to that ultimate light that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is giving us the ability to connect to. Call to Bachav We'll see each other again tomorrow. What do you think would have happened if you didn't discover Rabbi Reuben, if you kept on going to these other shuls and talking to these other rabbis? What do you think would have been the outcome then? I don't think I could have changed without it because there's nothing around me at the time which changed me. Honestly, everything would have been the same because nobody was making me feel like I was wrong. The acceptance, the welcome, everything was fine because everybody was doing the same thing. It's amazing. Nobody's going to tell you you're wrong. I'm not supposed to tell themselves. So all of their kidnapping, you hear the same stories and I don't think I would have changed. There's nothing to tell me I was wrong. And for me, I think I I'd still be doing the same thing honestly i don't think i would just stop and just gave up and walked away but at the same time i think i'd still been in the same spot i would not be where i'm at now where i'm pushing myself to work on myself instead of looking at other people he points me in directions and he gives the sources there's no uh, opinions there's no philosophy none of that he's giving you sources he's telling you directly what you need to do and you have to apply that's the biggest thing if you get your feelings hurt get your feelings hurt